Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 52, Men of the South Find Their Way. It's been a few episodes since we really have discussed what is going on in the South. Part of that comes down to B, who is focused on his own country, of course, and its ability to dominate others. The loss of Southern records from this period also affect what we can do and what we can say and really where we can go with all of this. In some cases, what we do have recorded for Gluising, Gwent, Dyfed, and Brechnog uh, is slim and it's stilted towards a Saxon point of view. Archaeology of the area suffers from a few things, including the end of Latin as an inscription tool in this period, and the death of the monastic life and the seizure by Henry VIII of those lands, and then, of course, the Norman conquest of Wales from 1067 until 1282, when most of the southeast of Wales was held by the marcher lords. There just isn't a lot for us to go on. And what we do have is mixed with poetry, fables, legends, and, of course, myth. But... We'll do what we can with the sources we have, and we'll, we'll make do to try and fill in at least a bit of the gaps, especially in this 7th century period, what we're, which we're talking about right now. One of our major sources during this period is the Welsh Annals, or the, in Latin, the Annals Cambriae, which is a complex Cambrio-Latin chronicle, which was compiled or possibly derived from Latin and other sources in St. David's, and of course, that being in Dyfeth. The earliest source of the annals comes from the 12th century, but it's suspected that it may have originated at least as early as the 10th century. Of course, that puts it 100 years after the history of Brythonium, and of course, even longer since Bede's writings and the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, for that matter, being collected. So it's not current, it's not necessarily greatly up to date. And, of course, to say that these chronicles are somewhat vague and suspect goes without saying, I think, simply because of these kind of problems. And in some cases, they do conflict with what we do know is true, which also creates problems with them. Uh, There are also some dating issues, but we won't go into either of those things here. Just keep in mind, suffice it to say, you can't always take everything they say at face value. And I'll be honest with you, there were points where I almost threw up my hands because some of the, the details were were crossing over on one source and another source, and there was mention of some people at some points and at other points, and, and I didn't know who was who and where was where and what's going on. So, unfortunately, some of this is, like I say, a bit speculative. Uh, Gwent and Glwysing are the kingdoms who inherited the land of the Silures and continued to avoid dominance by either Irish settlers in the 5th century or Saxons in the 6th. The two kingdoms continued to be important to the overall story of Welsh independence up until the normal Norman settlement in the 11th and 12th centuries. Much like Dyfed, we will lose contact with them, however, from the mid-7th century until the 9th century. By then, the kingdoms will be unified under one king, and the influence of the Saxons over the area will be felt, because, of course, at this point, Alfred becomes significant to the story, and his descendants influence South Wales quite dramatically at that stage. After Dryhum, uh, the South Welsh kingdoms continue the fighting against the incursion of these West Saxons. In fact, this area, between the two areas, between Gwent and Glywysing and Dyfed and the Cornish areas of Demonia, uh, there is a great number of battles which are discussed, and we're going to go into some of them here today. And... Like I said, we're going to get into stuff which I'm, I'm going to make simplistic, but let's be honest, there is some speculation that some of these aren't either accurate or there are some details that aren't quite right about them. But we'll do our best with what we have to make this something worth listening to, of course, for you, and something that makes some historical sense. So we're going to start after the Battle of Deerholm. Uh, the next succeeding battle after that of significance is in 580 AD, and it's uh, often called the Battle of Tintern or also known as the Battle of the Saxon Bridge. Uh, according to the 12th century book of Flandaf, uh, this is where the armies of the Kingdom of Gwent, led by Turig and his son Murig, uh, defeated the West Saxons and forced them to retreat from G- the Gloucester area. Uh, Turig uh, was mortally wounded and then was 
purported to have died three days later uh, because he was a Christian king fighting against a pagan group and combined with the fact that in his um, uh, saintly story, it's claimed that he went into a monastic life but left it on the urging to come back and help his son who was in trouble. Um, he was made a saint and he is called uh, in Latin uh, Theodoric. Now, after that event, this victory by the Welsh in this area happened to push back the Saxons at least for a brief period of time. However, in 610 AD, Erb, the king of the United Gwent, Glywysing, and Urgening, died, and his heirs broke the kingdoms up again into their various subkingdoms. We've talked a little bit about how this happens in Welsh history at times, and it causes trouble for the Welsh because without the unity, without that combined force, they can get into trouble. And it just so happens in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, in 611, Kinglais uh, becomes king. And he's the king of the West Saxons. And he would hold that kingdom for 31 years, which in that period of, of sub-Roman early Middle Ages, that's a long reign. And with that consistency, he's actually able to make a lot of headway. And he's able to expand the West Saxons to the West and threaten both the southeast of Wales and the kingdom of Demnonia uh, to the point where a number of battles are fought trying to contain them. Kinglais and, uh, and again, the Saxon names can be a little bit awkward, but uh, Twinhelm um, takes advantage of the death of the old Demonian king Bledric and invade Demonia. And in 614 AD, in what was likely a siege of the town of Badun, uh, possibly the current day uh, location is Binden, uh, over 2,000, now these are Cornish Welsh warriors, because of course the Anglo-Saxons call everybody who isn't them Welsh, um, died following the capture of the fort. Uh, and after this battle, likely much of Dorset was annexed by Wessex. So you can imagine that at this point, whatever connection, at least by land, which had been between uh, the Demonians and the Southeast Welsh, disappears at this point, but there's still alliances in place. Gwent and Dyfed, and even as far north as Gwynedd, at various points will come to the aid of the Demonians. And we're going to talk a lot about them in this particular chapter because there's so much of what's going on with them affects the other Welsh locations. Badly defeated, Bledric's son, Clemen, is forced to retreat back to Caer Usk, uh, modern-day Exeter. And it appears from the archaeology that even at that point, there were old Roman buildings that remained functional. So that may point out that there were still Brythonic peoples who were trying to maintain the old Roman standards and the old Roman ideas about provincial capitals and centers of uh, control. So... As this incursion continues into this century, uh, it weakens Dorset and the Somerset regions of the kingdom so that in independent groups of Saxons are actually able to make inroads over the next generation. They end up moving slowly, both by force and by just natural movement, into these areas, and they're able to force the Demonians back out of both Somerset and Devon eventually. Um, after the capture of Dorset, there seems to have been a lull for the West Saxon push in the rest of the southwest. This may have been due to the influence of the Northumbrians on the rest of the Heptarchy at the time, uh, which refers to the various kingdoms of the Saxons and Angles that are fighting over control of England at the time. Um, and at this point is when the Northumbrians start to take their huge rise under um, Edwin and start to become a problem for not just the Welsh, not just the Old North, but also for other people and they start to try and spread their dominion across all of England. And at one point came very close to probably doing just that, from what it seems. And what they ended up doing, of course, is creating a hostile force against them. Um, this probably also meant that this created the rise of a guy like Penda in Mercia and Cadwallon in Gwynedd because of this push. And, of course, they start looking for allies. So in 628 AD, Penda, Kinglais, and uh come to a treaty after a battle in South Saxon lands, likely creating the Saxon side of the anti-Northumbrian 
Confederacy, which is then led by Cadwallon, in probably the last time a, uh, a, a Welshman will lead a British uh, rebellion or a war, unless you want to go back to Henry VII, I guess, would be the next one, if you could call him that. Um, the next mentions of the South Wales are vague references with no context. Uh, found in the Welsh Annals is mentioned of the hammering of Dyfed, which the Monastery of David was burned. Uh, this is said to have happened in 645 AD, but there's no context. I looked all over the place trying to figure out if there's any sort of relationship, even mildly, to this event, and there is nothing. And there's hardly anything we get from Dyfed in this period. In fact, Dyfed will actually cease to exist as far as the historical record goes for about 100 years, right around the mid 7th century till about the er, mid 8th century and there's no reference as to why they still come out as Dyfed. They're, they're still a part of that kingdom but there's no reference as to why and if, also we have no idea who did this whether it was Irish, Welsh or Saxon in nature because of course it could have been any of those one of these parts of history that frustrates historians because there's tantalizing details but they're left so completely vacant we just don't know and whether there even was anything more than this random reference. And I mean, the Welsh Annals, much like the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, has some weird references that are never given any context, or are just totally vacant of what was going on at the time, like they'll talk about, oh, there was an asteroid scene, oh, the moon turned to blood this year, oh, did it, you know, and it's one minimal reference, you don't get another one for three, four, five, six years. And in fact, we have a similar situation here. The next reference we have of anything going on is in 649 AD. Again, this vague reference of a slaughter in Gwent. And there's nothing to explain what's going on. Was it a rebellion? Was it a uprising by a local lord? Was it a invasion by various for No idea. We have no context and it's so unfortunate. And th as I say, there's just this tantalizing sense that there's something there. But even archaeology hasn't been able to give us good reason to understand what it was. So we have this vacuum of information in the middle of all of this. So as we move along, however, in 652, and we are jumping forward in time very quickly, I'm afraid, the Battle of Bradford on Avon takes place. Now this is a West Saxon victory under Kynwell against the West Welsh. This battle was recorded in the, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. It refers, when they say West Welsh, they really mean Demonia. And it was a battle towards the bottom of the Dorset area. Area. It's a battle that was at the bottom of the Dorset area and is key to what is going to happen very shortly, which in 658, just a few years later, and at this point we're actually past and uh, past the results of the fight with Northumbria, where all of these various kings have now died, and the new kings are taking over, and uh, Wolf Hera is taking over in Mercia. So there's sort of a lack of other powers at this particular moment in time. And at this point, the Battle of Pinonum takes place in Somerset, where an allied force of these West Welsh, along with Gw uh, Gwent, and in fact, including the famous king. Cadwallar of Gwyneth uh, are fighting against, again, the West Saxons. Um, however, again, they lose. And again, they're pushed back. And in fact, these are just categories. And of course, they are mentioned in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, so you cannot for sure say that there wasn't victories by the, the Demonians and by Gwent that didn't happen at other points in time, but we don't get those. We really only get the stories of wins, not losses, right? Things that make the, look, the West Saxons look good, not bad, especially when it's being written from the perspective of the West Saxons. So take that into consideration when you're talking about the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. Really no different than the Welsh Annals, which are being written, obviously, from a Welsh point of view. Now we're going to touch on Cat, uh, Cadwallar a little bit later in his own episode, but I wanted to bring this up because this is likely the last of Gwyneth's power base in that period. And because it fell so quickly after the deaths of Penda and Cadafel, it shows that while there is an ability to spread 
an opposition from Gwyneth, they're they're not really able to enforce their will outside of their own territory. And and this is kind of a time where we see, and we'll talk about a lot later, the rise of Mercia. And at the same time that Mercia, of course, is rising, ironically, after Penda's death, uh, you have the collapse of power bases in other parts of the country, such as the West Saxons will find themselves in trouble fighting Mercia. Northumbria will find itself having a difficult time of it. And the Welsh countries will also find the same problem. These kingdoms will be dealing with a massive superpower, basically, on their doorstep, and it will force them into a backward step in the process. Now, what that means and what that will come to, we'll talk a lot about in the next episode when we get to talk about Mercia. So what we see now is that these battles are coming consistently and fast in the south. The so-called 665 Second Battle of Baden, uh, somewhere in the Cotswold Hills, which was also claimed to be a West Saxon victory against the Kingdom of Gwent and her local allies. The problem with this is, of course, then there has to have been a First Battle of Baden, and we don't know of one other than the writings of Gildas, and we don't know where that was. So we almost have no evidence of it at all. So take that in mind. Uh, by 660 or by 670 AD, the Saxons have captured Glastonbury, and much of Somerset and Dorset in the southwest are separated from the Welsh allies to the north. A hundred years after Durham, the march west continued to take land and resources from the Cornish kingdom of Demonia, and at this point is when that kingdom is effectively isolated and it is neutered in a way, I guess, is what I would say, from being an actual effective force against the Saxons. Um, the easy access to the major centers of the fertile South Wales meant that it was constantly in the firing line during the 7th and 8th centuries. This destabilization would lead the coming chaos of the 8th century with little historical writings on the period as Dyfed vanishes completely from the historical record, as I mentioned before, and at this point makes barely a peep. Uh, Demonia, of course, suffers continual reversals and will vanish for a time in the record. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle will make no mention of any part of Wales for, ne for the next nearly 100 years, as the kingdoms of the Heptarchy appear to settle into an uneasy peace. But we are not quite done with King Cadwallar, as he'll return with his legacy in a future program. We'll continue to talk about this influence. We'll also start to get into the era of Mercia's dominance, the rise of guys like uh, Wolf Hera, and eventually Offa. And then, of course, we'll be leading into eventually the coming of the Vikings and the influence it has across all of Britain. Because, of course, there is Welsh influences from the Vikings as much as there is anywhere else. Because the edges of Wales, both in the north and in the south, are exposed to Vikings in places like Dublin, in places like the Orkneys, in places like Scotland, and of course in the Yorkshire. So there will be this continual back and forth, and of course they will be all fighting over this this island to try and take control and wrest it from the other. And make no mistake, the Welsh have as much of a stake in trying to do that as the Vikings, as the Saxons, or anybody else for that matter. It, the, this will become a tripartite problem for all of these kingdoms going forward. And we have about two to 300 years of this up front of us very soon. Um, thank you everyone for uh, listening to this week. And uh, if you had a chance to listen at the beginning of this episode, we did announce two of our uh, donors from the Patreon. And I want to thank them once again for their donations. And if you are considering donating, I would very much appreciate it. And there are various tiers, so please go check it out. And very shortly, if not already, I will have a uh, podcast episode coming out specifically um, out of this group, but related to, the, to that uh, Patreon. So please consider having a listen and checking it out. But Again, that's something for a talk about at a later time. But anyway, if you have any comments, concerns, or questions, please reach me at the History, the Welsh History Podcast. You can visit our website at welshhistorypodcast.com or at uh, history.wales. 
Until next time, everyone, thank you for listening. Bye-bye. Edge of the Abyss Creations is a proud sponsor of the Welsh History Podcast, your one-stop shop for unique jewellery, paintings, and other crafty creations. You can find us at facebook.com slash edgeoftheabyss1. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more info, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com.